So, I've been thinking a lot about this person who I just recently learned about and I'm kind of shocked that I didn't know about them before. Their name is the Public Universal Friend, uh, known variously as PUF uh, or the Friend. And they were born in the early 1750s in Rhode Island into a um, Quaker community. So it was like 1750s in Rhode Island that's like just kind of pre the Revolutionary War. Maybe their parents were like recent immigrants from England. So a lot of Quakers came over I think around that time. So when they were 23, so in the early mid 1760s, they became really ill with uh, typhus, I, I guess is what historians think now. Um, and they were in a, like having a serious fever um, and kind of in delirium for like a week. And when they came out of the fever, they told the people who were caring for them that, that they had died and that they had gone to heaven and that they had uh, talked to God via two archangels across the street. And the, and God had said something like, there is room, room, room in the kingdom of heaven for all. And then sent them back to earth um, with a mission to do the work of the Lord <laughs> and also get, gave them a new name, uh, the Public Universal Friend. They had uh, been assigned female at birth and I think, well I feel conflicted about saying what their name was when they were born because like in sort of cur the tr current trans politic is you don't dead name someone although like this person was uh, you know not trans in the contemporary uh, understanding of the word they came out and they out of this fever and told everyone that they were now called the public universal friend which like also has a little bit of a relationship to public friends which were like Quakers who would go around to different communities and proselytize or whatever um, so they after this sort of took up a practice of preaching and sort of ecstatic preaching tradition um, they asked for people to uh, refer to them with like male pronouns um, or no pronouns uh, and they, they took up a habit of male dress but then also like would wear some certain things like they wouldn't wear a head covering but then they wore like a scarf around their neck. Um, so they were really inhabiting this like ambiguous uh, gender position um, for the times and some historians and like other just you know like the Wikipedia page for example like only refers to uh, the public universal friend as they or as the friend or PUF or public universal friend other uh, things I read and like video as I've watched um, refer to them as their birth name and refer to them as a woman who is like pretending to be a man. They started going around Rhode Island and um, doing their sort of preaching, gathering followers, mostly women were followers, um, and then like sometimes with their husbands, but uh, 
and they had these like weird situations where they would like get taken to court and then like the judge would be taken by them and they would be invited to like say uh like preach to the community or whatever but eventually they got kind of like run out of town or run out of Rhode Island just like there was an antagonistic environment Ooh, this is good just a second look at this watermelon So eventually they ended up going west to central New York and um, at that point it was it was not a place where settlers uh, already lived so they were like I always get so shy when I see other people. Okay, I'm just gonna bookmark that there because there's too many people around. I was watching a video about the public universal friend. Um, I think this person's channel, his name is Damon Garcia, um, is dedicated to like religious scholarship, theological, studies and history, something like that. He was talking about the Public Universal Friend um, and about spiritual possession and citing this anthropologist um, who talks about spiritual possession or possession by a spirit as a physiological or genetic inheritance. and kind of breaks down like how we can understand spiritual possession um, and also be a way to sort of shift your social circumstances and so his theory is like if particularly if you have like low social standing in your community that if you're like marginalized or oppressed uh, like becoming possessed by a spirit can be a way for you to transcend your circumstances um, but also uh, that the stress of those circumstances might cause you to become possessed and so he was talking about the public universal friends life right before they had their illness um, and their encounter with the archangels. One of the things that had happened was that their mother had died in childbirth. And then also they had been um, curious about some new religious, religious sects that were starting, excuse me, some new religious sects that were starting um, in Rhode Island at the time, um, particularly this group called the New Light Baptists. They end up getting um, expelled from their meeting, um, which had been their meeting, I think, for their whole life and their family and you know their whole social environment was around their religious meeting group. So, and then an another thing he mentioned is that at this point, the friend, um, was in their mid 20s and at that time you know women would have already been married and having children um, and that was how they had access to resources. Uh, Damon Garcia's thought is that the stress of all of these circumstances might have been what led um, the friend to become possessed by the Spirit of God in the way that they were. So, the friend ended up, like really actually shortly after their illness, in 1776, they went to 
I think the town square in Cumberland, which is where they're from in Rhode Island, and gave a sort of spontaneous sermon. And there was a lot of antagonism towards them for that, but they also started collecting followers, as I was saying before. But the, like, the attitude towards them was very contentious at the time. And a lot of people felt like they were breaking up homes because um, women who joined their community um, oftentimes left their families. They joined the sect and didn't get married um, because the Universal Friends, they were discouraged from getting married or having sex. There was like a, a program of celibacy. Like I said before, they ended up moving west. They ended up after the war ended. So I think in the 1780s, they like moved to Philadelphia for a short time. Um, and where can I go? They ended up getting run out of Philadelphia. I think uh, at one point, one of their chapels was burnt down. Um, they went back to Rhode Island and there were also some wealthy um, people who ended up giving the friend and the community um, a lot of money. Had to look at my notes. Um, so a, in particular, Judge William Potter, this um, judge in Rhode Island at the time ended up giving um, huge parts of, he was, I guess, quite wealthy and he gave huge parts of his fortune to the Universal Friends community. I think ended up giving them his house, his mansion in Rhode Island. And this made a lot of people suspicious um, and made a lot of people think that uh, the friend was, you know, a charlatan and a grifter. I'm doing that YouTube trick where I recorded the first part of this video like over a week ago. Um, but I changed into my original shirt for continuity. So eventually the friend decided that they wanted to move away from Rhode Island. They decided to move the community to central New York. The settlement that they founded they named Jerusalem or New Jerusalem. And a lot of the things I read, it said that they had uh, good relationships with the indigenous people who live there, which um, I think like a lot of accounts of early settlers uh, like to say that, you know, people had good relations with the indigenous folks. and um, But it, there is evidence that the friend and their group traded with the uh, local Anandaga and they kind of reached an agreement there's a dog pooping over there. <clears throat> Around the time that the friend moved to um, that area and uh, founded the settlement um, town of Jerusalem um, in 1794, there was a significant treaty that was signed between the US and um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is also referred to as the Iroquois Nations. Uh, and that treaty was called the Treaty of Canandaiga. Um, and some things I've read, uh, particularly an essay by T. Fleischmann, state that the friend was um, had some kind of significant role in the negotiation of that treaty. But I, besides the essay from T. Fleischmann, I haven't really found anything else that indicated that they were part of that the process of the treaty negotiations. The friend left time in 1819. From all accounts it seems like they got progressively more reclusive and um, eventually they built a house and lived alone for the last uh, few years of their life.
and after their death, the Society of Universal Friends kind of slowly petered out um, because of the mandate of celibacy. There wasn't a lot of new membership. <laughs> the society was just got kind of less organized and um, eventually there were no more members. Anyway, that's what I know about the Universal Friend. Um, if you like this video and want to see more videos from me that may or may not be like this one, um, you can subscribe and then if you want to like, like and then if you have a comment, comment. If your comment is you don't really know what you're talking about. This is performance art, so um, just keep that in mind. But also I'm here for everything you have to give me as feedback. Okay, goodbye!